make welcome tonight a great preacher, a man that has heard from God, Brother Jerry Jones. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord. Oh, what a presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God. Oh, Jesus. My Lord, my Lord. I am so deeply thankful for this meeting, what it has meant in my life. I have been privileged to be in every because of the times that has been held here. I am uh, constantly amazed at how my needs are so forcefully addressed year after year. I have come here desperate at times, feeling after God, so hungry to hear from God. Just, just a word, just the voice of God. And I have never left here that I was not lifted into His presence and renewed and felt His voice. And this year it seems very special to me because I have felt and heard and tasted such a nearness of God in this meeting. I have I've just felt like somehow, I'm sure it is because of the times, God has pulled back a curtain, given us a vision, somehow seen deep into His heart. In viewing His heart, we have seen our world. And I will, I will leave here changed. Once again. Praise God. And of course, I am deeply grateful for the privilege to stand here tonight, which I'm certainly not worthy, but I do feel I've heard from God. And I feel like that what the Lord has laid on my heart to say is for someone here. And I challenge you tonight, open your heart, and let God finish His work tonight. Praise God. Let's pray again in the name of Jesus. Come on, Lord, I have seen all my eyes. Eat all my eyes, shall I? Praise God. This month is 20 years ago I preached my first sermon here in Louisiana in Brother McGehe's church, Richland, Saturday night at a fellowship meeting. And I enjoyed it a lot more than they did and I was scared to death so you can imagine what they went through. I owe a lot to this district and it's such a thrill to be back in Louisiana. Esther chapter 5 will be my text tonight. I'm going to start reading with verse number 9 and read through verse 13. Esther 5, beginning with verse number 9. A very simple message tonight that I feel really burning on my heart. Then when Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him. He, Haman, was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children 
And all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther, the queen, did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow I am invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. I want to preach tonight on in the king's gate. In the king's gate. Let's pray again. Thank you, Lord, for what we feel, the glory of your presence. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I praise your name, O oh God. Quicken us tonight. Quicken our minds, our hearts. Oh, Jesus. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. We, you and I, we have an adversary. There's two things very basic that we think we know about him that I think sometimes we find it easy to forget. First of all, he is not a straw man concocted by preachers like someone concocts the bogeyman to keep kids in line. He is real. And He is powerful. He has exerted His influence in our world, captured our generation, Spread His Gospels. Every influence of evil nature in our world is His handiwork and a testimony to His presence. Every abused child, every battered wife, every broken home, every murder, every robbery, every war, Every hungry baby, every hospital, every funeral home, every cemetery is a testimony that we have an adversary. Yes. Amen. Right. 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 He is referred to by so many names in Scripture. Lucifer, son of the morning star, the covering cherub, the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, the father of lies, a liar, a deceiver a destroyer, the God of this world, the prince of the powers of the air. So many names. All of them groping, trying to describe the nature of this, our adversary. But none more graphic, and I think none closer to the truth than the words of the Apostle Peter. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Your adversary. He is a personal devil. He knows your name. He knows your weak points. He knows your proclivities. He knows what you think about. He knows what you tend toward. And I want you to know tonight, He's after every one of us. Preachers and preachers' wives are not immune, nay, but rather they are His favorite target for His fear and depression and doubt for the weapons that He has exerted against us. He's your adversary. And he is a lion. Like a roaring lion. Now in Simon Peter's day, there were lions in Palestine. 
He knew whereof he wrote when he was moved on to describe our adversary as a lion. The lion is nature's most deadly killing machine. The feared king of beasts. It travels through the, dun the, the jungles without fear of any other creature. The average male lion weighs between 350, 500 pounds. He stands three and a half feet tall and he's nine feet long. He can see clearly in pitch black night. He can run 35 miles an hour, hour after hour. He can run down, leap on, snap the spine up, and drag away a 600 pound zebra. It would take six grown men to drag that same zebra. And he ain't happy with you. Pretty upset. Back in the night out there. Now he's not in here. There's one thing he's scared of, and that's what's in here right now. But waiting for you out there, his yellowed eyes, watching. He knows you came to because of the times, and he ain't happy about that. Because some of us drug in here are pretty weak, pretty battered, pretty bloody. He almost had us where he wanted us. He had worried us into a corner of discouragement and despair. He was ready to deliver the coup de gras, and we made our way to because of the time. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of anxious to get back out in the battle. I'm a little bit rejuvenated, reconstituted. I'm encouraged and strengthened. And I think he's in a little bit of trouble when I get back out yonder on the battlefield. The first thing you've got to remember about the devil is he's real and he's powerful and he hates your guts and he's after you. And you are no match for him. He's bigger than any one of us here. We cannot hold off his claw, his teeth. He is greater than we are. But the second thing you've got to keep in mind is he ain't greater than our Jesus. Our Jesus is greater than our adversary. Once again, it because of the times I have been reminded that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I am encouraged because I have been reminded that when I go out there, I do not go alone. I will never face him with the pitiful weaponry of my abilities and my strength. But I will march in the power and the strength of Jesus Christ before us. Who can be against us? When you go home, you're going to take some of this with you. When you go home, you're going to have a renewed armor, a renewed weapon, a renewed encouragement, a renewed strength. And when you meet him, you will not be alone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I like to talk about the Sunday school class that the teacher was teaching on temptation. Eight-year-olds, lots of big sinners in there, you know. The teacher said, what is temptation? Little eight-year-old girl. How come the girls are always like that? Little eight-year-old girl. Teacher said, yes, honey. She said, temptation is when the devil comes knocking on my door and asks me to come out and play with him. <laughs> Teacher said, that's, that's, that's good. That's just about right. So then she said, what do you do about temptation when you're tempted? Little girl's hand went back up. Same little girl. Teacher said, okay, honey, what do you do? She said, well, whenever I hear a knock 
at my door. My mama said that you never open the door until you look through that little peephole and see who that is on the other side of that door. So I go up to that little peephole and I look through that door and I see the devil standing there with my address on a piece of paper. So what I do is, see, he don't know, but Jesus lives in my house. So I say, Jesus, would you go to the door? And Jesus always says, I'll be glad to go to the door. So he walks up to the door, turns the knob and opens the door, and the devil's expecting to see little bitty me there. But instead he sees big old Jesus standing at the door. And Jesus smiles real big, and the devil's eyes get about that big around. And he crushes up that piece of paper and says, excuse me, I think I got the wrong house. My Jesus is greater. Jesus into our world. He is greater than any power or principality with which we war. Our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty. Please be seated. He's not just described as a lion. But as a roaring lion. I don't want to make anybody mad, but I've heard people say that he roars because he's got no teeth. And all he can do is roar. Well, I don't know what devil you've been fighting lately. <laughs> But the devil been after me, he's got all of his teeth. And somebody else's too, I think. Take my word for it. Don't go sticking your hand in his mouth because you think he can't bite you. He can bite you. He's not seeking whom he can gum and saliva all over. He's seeking whom he may devour. We're not dealing with a dead lion. He's alive. And he is well. No, a lion does not roar out of frustration because he cannot devour. He roars out of his arrogance. Out of his bloodlust. His supreme confidence drives him to announce his presence just before the kill. He is not afraid that his prey will escape So he roars. He glories in the ruthless tyranny over the hapless souls of men. He luxuriates in the oppression that he has brought to the hearts of my generation. He surveys a world groveling at his feet and he roars out his delight and his defiance against the church of the living God. He is defeated, but he doesn't believe that. He has not slackened his efforts, nor curtailed his plans. Perhaps he does believe that in the end a hell awaits him. If that's so, then he is determined to take everyone with him. I think nowhere in Scripture is an example of this cold beast of slaughter so graphically portrayed than in the character found in Esther. The deputy of 
King Ahasuerus, his name was Haman. This arrogant, ambitious man rose to power in the courts of the king with unparalleled ruthlessness. He loved his ill-gotten power. He loved to crush his adversaries and gloat over their failures. He had a lust for control, prestige, honor. And the more helpless his victims, the more he seemed to take delight in destroying them. Let me tell you something. There is no mercy in the devil. None. He never feels compassion. There is no compassion on a two-year-old baby with AIDS, not in the heart of the devil. No compassion on the bleary-eyed, shattered dreams of a heart that's been given to drugs or alcohol. It does not move him. He's not too proud to drag down a sick lamb or an old ram that has grown defenseless. He has absolutely no mercy. You don't hear a lot from him when you're on fire, when you just left because of the times and you're ready to deliver a one-two punch right to the end of his chin. But when you're discouraged and you're half burned out and pressures are rising, he has no mercy, he has no compassion. It is then that he comes. When you're alone and afraid, and you mumble room words in a dark room that you'd never mention to anybody else. That's when he's there. I hear Haman boasting. He called all of his friends together, called his wife together. I wonder how many times they had heard him seeing this slide presentation. Boasting of his, the glory of his riches. The multitude of his children, his offspring. Reminding them again and again of what he had done. What he had accomplished. How his praises were sung from one end of the city of the kingdom to the other. What a world the devil must survey tonight. One point six million Teenagers, 14 years and under, are alcoholics or problem drinkers in America. Teenage suicides have soared 700% in the last decade and a half. A major condom manufacturer recently announced they are targeting the 13 to 15 year old market. And their excuse is they're going to do it anyway. They might as well be protected. 51% of all American teenagers lose their virginity by high school graduation. A major sports figure admits a lifetime of decadence and gross immorality has infected him with a terminal disease. And he's made a hero and a spork, spokesman for a mythical safe sex that will surely condemn thousands of others to die the same horrible death that awaits him. Oh, how the devil must boast when he gathers his imps around and reminds them again and again of the glory of his riches. And the multitude of his children. This year, 1992, 352,620 American teenagers will be abused in their own homes. This year, 1,199,660 of them will run away from home. 40% of them will never return. And many of them will disappear into the black hole of child pornography and prostitution, both gay and heterosexual, on the streets of our major cities. 50,000 American teenagers will spend 1992 locked up in juvenile prisons. 922,345 American teenage girls will get pregnant this year. 
one out of every four babies born in America are born to an unwed mother. This year, 401,135 teenage girls will destroy their babies in their womb. And I don't care what the psychologists excuse. They will live with the guilt and the regret and the remorse and the self-hatred of it the rest of their lives. And pornography marches on. A multi-billion dollar business growing grosser and more lewd year after year after year. The street corner pusher still plies his trade in millions, just can't say no. Alcohol claims its grisly harvest of misery, murder, and mayhem and continues to sponsor our major sporting events. Tobacco will claim 100 or 200,000 lives this year and another 50,000 innocents who never put a cigarette between their lips. My God, the devil must enjoy the view that he sees when he looks at our world. I don't know about you but I am sick and tired of the devil having his way, doing his thing walking high and wide and proud through my generation I am tired of the carnage I am tired of the human misery I am tired of the broken dreams and shattered lives. I am tired of the hurting. I am tired of seeing their glassy eyed stares as they stumble like zombies through a life they cannot understand my God, it is time for the church to realize who we are and what we have and what we can do in our world. You preached it, Elder. My God, if we don't reach them, who's going to reach them? If we don't take the truth to them, the Mormons will be there. The Jehovah's Witnesses will be there. If we don't reach them, the cults will be there. I mean the real cults. They'll be there. My God, if we don't do it, there's nobody! Oh, yes, says Haman. Look at the glory of my riches. Look at the multitude of my children. When I get on my horse and ride into town, they bow along every avenue. Business comes to a halt and they duck their heads and pledge their obedience and obedience. When I come to town, everybody bows. They did not bow for Haman because they wanted to. They bowed out of fear. They bowed because they were slaves of the system of tyranny that he had constructed in that kingdom. Oh, how he bragged. And then he continued and said, In fact, so vast is my power that there's really only one thing that bothers me. But it really does bother me. There's only one thing between me and the fulfillment of my dreams. His friends and wife must have said, what is that? So absolute is your power, so awesome is your reach. What in the world could it be that bothers you? That, that, that stands in your way. And the devil incarnate, Haman says, you know how I have to take the main highway into town? Yeah. And you know how I get in there and I take a right, the first red light? Yeah. And going down to the palace, you know how I have to pass the king's gate? Yeah. yeah. Every day, not one day or two, but every day when I pass that gate, folks are just a-bowing and a-scraping everywhere. They're singing my praises, but every time I pass that gate, there's this one old Jew named Mordecai. And he don't bow. He won't bow. Everybody else bows. But he won't bow. And it's got to bother me so bad, 
said the devil. That all of this other has ceased to give me any joy. All of this other has ceased to satisfy my hunger. None of it really matters anymore. I don't even notice all them people bowing. I got eyes for one thing. I wish so bad that one day, just one day, I could go to town and go to the king's court and pass the king's gate and that too not be sitting in that gate. I wish one day he'd stay home sick. I wish one day he wouldn't be there. But every day I can't take my eyes off of the king's gate. And every day there he sits. Every day he stares back at me. Every day there's a little smile a playing at his lips. Every day he seems to telegraph a message. I ain't going to bow. I ain't going to give in. I'm not going to be like others. I'm going to stay true. I refuse to do obeisance to someone like you. And it bothers me. The enemy has told you, you don't matter. Brother Tinny, you touched us today. It's so true. We all struggle with feelings like that. And we feel like we haven't accomplished anything. He's going to perch on your doorstep. He'll meet you when you get out of the car. He'll walk up the hall with you. He'll remind you of how little, how no good, how down in the dirt you really are. Okay, devil. All right, devil. I may never pastor a church like Alexandria. I may never preach at a general conference. I may never even sit on the platform. For and because of the time, but I want you to know one thing every day, every day, every day, I'm gonna meet you in the King's Gate at my city, in my town, in my community. You can look for me every day. I'm gonna be there every day. I'll meet you in prayer, I'll meet you in consecration, I'll meet you in worship every day. Every day you live, you are a thorn in his side. Every day you pray, you are holding back his kingdom. Every day you pray, you are an irritation in his mind. You're an eyelash in his eye. You're an ache in his tooth. Every day you live, I don't care how big your church, I don't care how long you've been preaching. Every day, every day, he passes the king's gate. And if you're sitting there, you rob him of his joy. You rob him of his satisfaction. You rob of his arrogance every day. going back to the hotel from church today and in a red light I passed a big old pickup truck. Big old white pickup truck. Must have had eight tires on that thing. I don't know. Big old truck. And I looked up in there. There was this little bitty. And that sounds funny coming from me. But there's this little bitty guy and a little bitty lady sitting right beside him. And her hair was fixed up so pretty. And I knew I was looking at an evangelist. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Tears came to my eyes. Not just out of sympathy. But I remember my seven years out there. There are evangelists here tonight and you can't. You have to admit you've never had one of those hundred soul revivals. You've never had one of those times when just hundreds have poured into your altars when you preach. But I'm telling you, oh, I'm telling you, you get in that old pickup. You hook up to that travel trailer. You get in that motor home. You get in that car. And you keep going to the king's gate. Every day, you stand in the king's gate. And when the God of this world comes a-walking by, you put out that chest and say, I hadn't had yet what I'm expecting to have. But you can look for me in the king's gate. You can look for me in the king's gate. Every day, I'm going to be here. Every day, I'm going to be faithful. Let me tell you something. What I'm preaching to you tonight is this. Go home. Get in the king's gate. And stay there. I don't care what happens or doesn't happen. I don't care how you feel or how you don't feel. Just get in the king's gate. The devil's coming by. He needs to see there's somebody that ain't going to quit. There's somebody that ain't going to give in. Get in the king's gate. The devil fears men who will stay in the king's gate and will not bow because he knows even if we don't what we are capable of.
that one of these years you're going to come to because of the times and it ain't going to just be preaching and it ain't going to just be a thrill but you're going to go home and recognize there is a power lying within your bosom that can change your world turn it upside down and he knows if you just stay in the king's gate long enough you're going to make a difference whatever you do get to the gate every day yes the devil does not fear our talent, our abilities, our education, our vocabularies, but he fears our faithfulness. Because nothing is required of us except faithfulness. Because God Almighty knows that to the faithful all things are possible. Don't judge your ministry by the outward signs of success. They can be duplicated by carnal means and men. But you're a great preacher if like Jeremiah your tears do not bring revival. But you keep on weeping. If like Daniel the answer tarries for week after week. But you keep on praying. If like Job you search desperately for him. And it seems he has hidden himself from you. But you don't give up the search. You just keep on looking. Because sooner or later my friends. To those who stay in the gate. To those who will not bow. To those who will hang on. Sooner or later. God is going to reward. And send that revival. That our parents pre-prayed for. God is going to honor. Our faithfulness. Do not misunderstand. I'm not preaching to excuse laziness. I'm preaching to get us to be faithful. Yeah. To keep believing when there's no answer. To keep praying when there's no response. We are not called to be faithful as long as we get results or until times get tough. But we are called to be faithful until death. Some days... It's easy to get to the gate. You can't wait to get out of bed. Throw on your clothes, part your hair, and head off down to the gate. And we ruin his day from a long ways off on those days. Because way down the road, he sees us right there. Already in the gate. Does this guy never sleep? He's already at the gate. Other days, you have to crawl every inch to get to the gate. Some days it costs blood and suffering as you drag wounded limbs trying to get to the gate. But I plead with you, whatever the cost, the world depends on it. Whatever it takes, somebody's desperately depending on us. We cannot allow anything to keep us from the gate. Some days we might even be late getting to the gate. He might ride right up to that gate. He doesn't hear the cries of those who are worshiping. His eyes are blind to all those who are kneeling. He is searching for that one. They're not here today. A smile comes to his face. Maybe, just maybe, he finally gave up. I finally won the battle. And then just before he passes the gate, here we come, staggering in. Our tie askew. Our hair messed up. But we're here. You hear me, devil? I'm here. It was tough Sunday night, but I'm here. I've had a bad day, but I'm here. I ain't give up yet. I'm not quitting yet. I'm here. Grinning and waving. We're still here. You haven't got us yet. We're still here, robbing you of your joy. Call us a cult, and we're still here. Tell us we're crazy. We're still here. Try to steal our worship. We're still here. Try to divide us with issues. We're still here. We're in the gate. Every day. Every day. Every day. We need a rebaptism 
of determination. Oh, that's it. Determination. Yes, sir. A man who will not quit cannot be defeated. Right. Right. Jesus. I just ain't quitting. I just won't, I'm sorry, I won't quit. You can quit. I ain't quitting. I'm a one God apostolic tongue talking preacher. And I ain't quitting. Right. I ain't quitting. I'm sorry. Didn't say I won't get discouraged, but I'm not going to quit. Right. I didn't say I won't get knocked down, but I'm going to keep getting up. I'm just not going to quit. That's all. I ain't quitting. Some days I make my, may make miles of progress. Other days it might be measured in less than inches. But I'll be back tomorrow. Don't you worry. I ain't going to quit. I'm just not going to stop. Nothing's going to stop me. Nothing's going to keep me from winning. I'm going to stay with it. I'm just not going to quit. God, give us a baptism of determination that when we get home and it's the same 30 faces and it's the same problems and it's the same troubles, we will not be overwhelmed. We will not be defeated. I'm just not going to quit. I'm not going to quit. Paul said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. I'm set. 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 Let me tell you something. We got some things worth defending. Right. We've got a gospel worth defending. Yes. To defend to the death, to tooth and claw. We've got some things worth defending here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. It's not just a scripture that ought to get us excited in meeting. It is truth. And it is power within our hearts. We need to defend it against those who would attack the truth of one God. We need to defend our gospel. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And you shall. That don't excite you. That excites me. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you. And unto your children. And to all that are far off. Hallelujah. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call I still believe in old fashioned repentance to turn our hearts from sin and toward God I believe baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is an absolute essentiality in order to be saved and I believe the Holy Ghost is not an added blessing it's not a good thing to have it is absolutely necessary if you're going to heaven believe the Holy Ghost is essential because it puts you in the church. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. I believe it's essential because only by the Holy Ghost can you know Him, have a relationship with Him as Lord. No man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. I believe it's essential because you do not belong to Him if you do not have His Spirit. For if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of His. And I believe it takes the Holy Ghost to go in the rapture of the church. If the Spirit of Him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, then He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. I believe we have a lifestyle that's worth defending. During National Youth Congress in Kansas City this summer, I was interviewed by Mrs. Helen Gray, who is religious editor for the Kansas City Star. She called me. She said, what a, a great meeting. Five, six thousand teenagers in town. And uh, she said, I sent a photographer down there last night. I said, great. He said, he got some real good pictures. I said, great. She said, I have a question. <laughs> said he was very impressed 
Said he got back here to the newspaper office this morning and all he could talk about was that meeting last night. That's all he could talk about. All those young people. He said he was very impressed. But I'm, I'm sorry to say he wasn't that impressed with the preaching. He wasn't all that impressed with the music. At least that's not what he said. She said he kept saying over and over, those kids. Those kids. I've never seen a bunch of kids like that. They look so clean. They looked so pure. They look so happy. She said, how do you do that? I said, we teach three things. That the church is not an accessory to life. It is the centerpiece of life. I said, we teach the family is the centerpiece in God's plan. And that He should reside in every home and in every family. And I said, thirdly, we teach that everybody, no matter who they are, no matter whether they were born and raised in this church or not, everybody must have a personal relationship, must have His Spirit and His name, and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when that happens, it's not us, it's Him. It's His presence and His power that lives within them. The world is hungry for what we have and what we represent. Cable News Network did a poll the early part of last year. They polled many teenagers. They asked several questions. One of the questions they asked, many of them had to do with religion. One of them was this. What religion are you most interested in? And what religion would you be most prone to join? And the overwhelming majority of the young people of America who responded to that poll said that the religion they were most interested in is Pentecost. And the religion they would most likely join is Pentecost. I don't want to go that way. They're coming our way. Let's just stay in the gate. What you say? Let's just stay in the gate. He said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. That means his feet were planted. He was determined. He had a made up mind. You're going to have to decide what you believe. And you're going to have to live by those convictions. And there will be those who will not like them. But you're going to have to make up your mind. And plant your feet. And say, I can do no other. God, help me. Here I am. If you're going to be set for the defense of the gospel, you're going to have to... Be balanced. You know what you said today? Balanced. See, if you lean to the right, I'm about to mess up here. I'm too old. You can't elect me anymore anyway. Lean to the right or lean to the left, he's going to shove you whichever way you're already leaning because you're overbalanced. So Paul said, let's get set. Make up your mind what you believe. Get your convictions down in your soul. And then get some balance in your life. That when he comes and he lays one right on the end of your chin, you don't go down. You take the punch. And you say, all right, let's see you do it again. And when he does, say, all right, I'm balanced here. I'm balanced. My mind's made up. I know who I am. I know what I believe. I know what I got. And I know where I'm going. Get balanced. Not all shout. And no word. But my God, not all word and no shout either. We need to get balanced. Please sit down. I'm going to quit in a minute. And determined. I was in a restaurant in Miami the other day. It reminded me of my favorite story. Rocky Marciano used to eat in that restaurant all the time. In fact, the day he was killed in a plane crash, I think it was the day before his birthday, and they had baked him a birthday cake. He was due in that restaurant to celebrate his birthday. Rocky Marciano, heavyweight champion of the world, never defeated. Never. Never defeated. One time late in his career, he fought a man named Ezra Charles. I met a man who was at that fight, 1952. I wasn't there. <laughs> my daddy listened to it on radio. I heard about it all my life, thrilled in it, met a man who was there, and he told me about it. 
I used to say that Ezra Charles was bigger, and he was, and he was, he, was, he was faster, and he was, he was younger, he was, had a longer reach, he was quicker on his feet, he was a better boxer, all that's true. And I used to say that he, he was stronger, he hit harder than Marciano. But an old man, an old gentleman, corrected me the other day. He said, you wrong. He said, Marciano wasn't as fast, wasn't as young, he wasn't, didn't have as long a reach, but he had more power. Looked pretty bad for the champ. Everybody said he'd get ripped. This was it. It was over for him. And it looked like it. Round two he went down. I believe it was round four. He went down again. He went down, I believe, six times in that fight. Six times. The fellow that was there said his face looked like somebody attacked him with a meat cleaver. He was cut everywhere. Blood was flowing everywhere. And he had blood all over his gloves. They'd wipe the blood off and the ref would say something to him and he'd shake his head. He'd always get up at the eight count, pop his gloves together and get back in the middle of the ring. He just wouldn't quit. He just wouldn't stop. He'd take a blow and go down, but he'd struggle back up and get back in the fight. They got to notice him. My daddy told me this. They talked about it on the radio. How Ezra Charles would, would motion him. Don't get up. Stay down. They said, isn't that great? He's feeling sorry for the champ. Stay down. Nobody noticed about round 12. The challenger was getting tired. He was landing so many punches. It was giving him out. And his guard was dropping a little bit. And Marciano waited and waited and waited. It looked like he was defeated. It looked like there was no hope. But suddenly he saw his opening. And with one wicked right hand, right to the edge, right to the end of the chin, down went the challenger like somebody had poleaxed him. Seven, eight, nine, ten. You're out and still champ. Rocky Marciano. They interviewed him later. They said, did you, did you realize he was bigger? He was faster, younger. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I, knew, I knew all that. Do you think he'd knock you down? Oh, yeah, I knew he'd knock me down. Did you think he'd win the fight? Oh, no, no, I knew he, I knew he would win the fight. <laughs> you knew he'd knock you down, yeah. But you knew he wouldn't win, yeah. How did you know? And the champ of the world said, I knew all I had to do was just keep getting up. Sooner or later, I would get my chance. And all I wanted was one punch. Devil, you keep fooling with us. And we're going to get our punch. And when we do, it's going to be over. Rejoice not against me, oh my enemy. For when I fall, I shall. Arise. Even as her Charles said, I wasn't feeling sorry for him when I motioned him to stay down. I knew if he kept getting up, it would be all over. The devil is afraid of what you're able to do when you get back home. If you get in the gate and stay in the gate and don't quit. One more word about the defense of the gospel. You do not defend the gospel by circling the wagons and living a paranoid life, afraid of everything that might happen. David defeated the lion and defeated the bear, and they attacked him. But the day came when he went on the attack. And he went after Goliath himself. It's time to march to the gates of hell and grab them, pull them out of the fire. Say you had them long enough. That's long enough. That's long enough. Please remain standing out just, to, just in a minute. Why the king's gate? Why? It's a place where the elders sit. Where wisdom and experience were. Don't ever forsake the king's gate. Don't ever forget the elders. It was a place of judgment, of rightness and fairness. So many things in this world are not fair. The wicked prosper. Wrong triumphs over right. Hatred over love. War over peace. But not in the king's gate. It takes time, but sooner or later... Fairness, justice prevails in the king's gate. And a cup of cold water given in his name will get its reward. 
No sackcloth in the king's gate. Wasn't, it wasn't allowed. Leave your moaning and your groaning, your complaining, your criticism, your doom and your gloom. Leave it outside. This is a place of worship, a place of praise, a place of rejoicing, a place of faith. That's the king's gate. It was a place of safety. Haman could not get to Mordecai as long as he was in the king's gate. He said, I'll have to kill the whole bunch of them to get a hold of Mordecai. If the church is functioning as it was designed to function, when you get back home and you're all alone, you are no more vulnerable there than you are here. Because to get you, he's got to go through us. If we're doing like we ought to be doing. So we all know the story. Don't we? The end of the story. Built a gallows. Going to hang Mordecai. But the hell that the devil has made of our world. Will be magnified. And he will be turned in. He will hang on his own gallows. But I have to admit there are times standing bruised, bloody, broken in the king's gate. I wish there was something a little bit more immediate. Well, let me tell you the story of what happened before the end of the story. The king couldn't sleep one night. So he called a scribe and said, Read the Chronicles to me, would you? <laughs> and the scribe read of a time that there were two of the king's trusted advisors who decided to slay him. But there was a man who was faithful. Yes. A man, said the scribe, who was loyal, who sat in the king's gate, who heard. And delivered the king from this conspiracy of death. Then the king leaped to his feet. And Ahasuerus said, What have we done for such a faithful man? And the scribe said, We have done nothing for him. And the king said, Who stands in the court? And someone said, Haman stands in the court. See, Haman showed up to get permission to kill Mordecai. That's right. Talk about bad timing. <laughs> For Mordecai had been the faithful man that had saved the king's life. And the king called Haman in and said, Haman, you're a wise man. What would you do for a faithful man? A man who remains in the king's gate, who is loyal and true, a man in whom the king delighted to honor. Haman's wicked heart said, It must be me, so he said, what I would do for a man that stays in the king's gate. I would bring the king's own raiment. Not the fake stuff, the stuff you really wear. I'd bring the king's own horse. And I'd bring the crown royal. And I'd get a high ranking member of the king's court. And I'd lead him through the city. Wearing the king's garment with a crown royal on his brow riding the king's horse until everybody in town saw and heard look what happens to a man in whom the king delighted to honor good idea said it I has your ears Here's my raiment, here's my crown, get my horse, Mordecai's outside. Put the raiment on his back. Put the crown on his head. Help him get on the horse. And you lead it, Haman. Get a hold of the reins and take him through town. Let everybody see him. And yell in your best voice. Look what happens to a man in whom the king delights to honor. There is coming a day as sure as we're here that those who cried their hatred and those
those who labeled us a cult and those who fought against us will see us march through the cities. They'll see us go through our towns. They'll hear their own voices cry. Look what happens to a man that the king delights to honor. Stay in the gate. Go home. Get in the gate. Don't ever leave it. Be there every day. I feel it in my bones. Our hour is a coming. I feel revival coursing through this generation. Get in the gate!